Tyler. Mr. Tyler, does the defense have any more questions qualifying this panelist for the jury? Your Honor, it's not my intention to delay this court. I know that we've been more than a week in selecting the jury. However, nor is it my intention to hurry you unduly, Mr. Tyler. But can we complete our jury with this man, or do you object to him? I don't object to him individually. He says that he has already formed an opinion as to the guilt of the defendant, but would lay that opinion aside and abide by the evidence. Your Honor has ruled that eight of the 11 jurors already selected had such opinions, but are qualified. I challenge him for cause. Overruled. He is qualified for the jury, and that completes the jury. Your Honor, at this time, I request that this entire jury be dismissed and I ask once more for a change of venue to another county. Can you offer any reasonable grounds why this trial should be moved to another county? Nine members of the jury have already admitted that they have formed opinions as to the guilt of the defendant without hearing any evidence. Of the 500 jurors examined, over half said they could not serve because they were prejudiced against the defendant and were excused by your honor. Some of the jury have actually seen physical evidence displayed on TV. I've heard a captain of detectives say, that's the man who killed the president. We have a cinch case. How can any jury be in part? You have been asked this question individually. Now I ask you as a jury, could you and would you put aside anything that you may have seen, heard, or read about this case? and decided solely on the basis of sworn testimony coming to you from the witness stand and from the charge given you by this court. If you cannot answer yes to this question, speak now. Mr. Tyler, your request for a change of venue is denied. Are you ready, gentlemen? Bring in the defendant. Now, I want to warn the spectators in this court. Most of you are reporters, and you represent public communication media for the whole world. Now, you have every right to be here but you must abide by my rulings as to conduct in this court. No cameras of any kind will be allowed. I will not tolerate any outburst, any talking among yourselves, any laughter, nor anything that would interfere with the normal orderly presentation of testimony. Arraign the defendant. In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, the grand jurors do present in and to the criminal district court of Dallas County that one Lee Harvey Oswald, on the 22nd day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1963, in the state aforesaid, did then and there with malice aforethought Kill John Fitzgerald Kennedy by shooting him with a gun. Lee Harvey Oswald, how do you plead? Your Honor, the defendant stands mute. A standing mute under the law is equivalent to pleading not guilty. Your Honor, as counsel for the defense, I would like to add to that plea an additional plea of not guilty by reason of existing insanity. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Not guilty, and not guilty by reason of existing insanity. Call your first witness for the state, Mr. Atkins. Directing your attention to the 22nd day of November of the year 1963 at approximately 12.30 p.m. Would you please tell the court and the jury where you were. Well, my girlfriend and I had decided to spend our lunch hour by going down to watch the president go by, to watch the motorcade. No. 
Would you tell us specifically where you were and how you got there? We were afraid there would be too many people on Main Street, so we walked on down and stood in the grassy slope just this side of the triple underpass. That's near the corner of Elm and Houston Streets. Would you describe what happened? The president's car turned the corner and started toward us on Elm Street. There were a lot of motorcycle police in front of the president's car. <laughs> My friend was afraid I didn't see the president, so she said, look, there's the president's car. Get a picture of him. He turned to us and waved. He faced forward again. I lifted my Polaroid. Just as I snapped the picture, I heard a shot. My Polaroid showed the president slumped over in, in the car, and it shows his wife leaning toward him. I heard her say, my God, he's been shot. Then I heard another shot or two ring out. What else did you see? Well, the motorcade kept going at the same speed for a moment. Then it sped up. S some of the policemen sped up and some stopped. Sirens were blowing and everywhere. And people were falling on the ground. I saw this man standing next to me throw his little boy on the ground. So my friend and I fell on the ground too. Thank you. Your witness. Ma'am, did you see the person or persons who fired the shots you heard? No, sir. I couldn't tell where they were coming from. No further questions. Stand down, please. Call your next witness. Where were you at about 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963? I was standing near the Texas School Book Depository Building at Elm and Houston Streets. Describe what you heard and saw. After I heard the first shot, I looked up and saw this man pointing a rifle out of a window. I saw him fire a second shot. He didn't seem to be in a hurry. Now, where was this window? Well. It was in the school book building. On the floor next to the top. It's the sixth floor, I think. On the far right. Now, would you describe the man you saw at the window? He was a slender guy. A nice looking guy. Do you see that man in this room today? I just got a glimpse of him. I wasn't close enough to really see his face. Pass the witness. Did you see this person fire a third shot? Yes, I did. Well, what kind of rifle did you see, sir? I don't know what kind, just a rifle. Did the rifle have a telescopic sight on it? Well, I don't know. I couldn't see that good. That's all. Thank you. How were you employed on November 22nd, 1963? Resident Chief of Neurosurgery at the Parkland Hospital. That's in Dallas? Yes. Would you describe what happened on that day shortly after noon? The police department had called the hospital and said that uh, the president had been shot and was being rushed to Parkland. I got to emergency operating room number one several minutes after the president had been taken there. About 10 or 12 doctors and members of the hospital staff were working, attempting to save the president's life. Would you describe the president's condition? I observed uh, two wounds one in the lower front portion of the neck and one in the right rear of the head. The eyes were fixed and the pupils dilated. I realized that uh, there was very little hope uh, for the patient. 
At what time was the president pronounced dead? We pronounced him dead at 1 p.m., immediately after the priests had administered the last rites. I was chosen to sign the death certificate because it was felt that it was a neurological death. And to what cause did you attribute the death, Doctor? The death resulted from gunshot wounds in the head and neck that caused extensive damage to the brain tissue and uh, respiratory system, resulting in massive hemorrhaging. Your witness, Counselor? Would you describe briefly, Doctor, what steps were taken to save the President's life? A tracheotomy was performed and tubes were inserted to assist the patient's breathing. One of the doctors remembered that the President suffered an adrenal uh, deficiency and he immediately administered hydrocortisone. A catheter was inserted in his left arm and transfusions were given. We administered a closed chest massage. Doctor, why didn't you open the patient's chest and massage the heart directly? We all knew that he was dead, and nothing more could be done for him. Did you recover any bullets from the patient's body? No, we did not probe the patient's wounds. After you attended the president, did you make the following statement? There were two wounds. Whether they were related, I do not know. It was an entrance wound in the neck, the head wound would have been either an exit or a tangential entrance wound. Yes, I did make that statement at the time. However, later I learned from the autopsy report... Thank you, Doctor. That's all. Doctor, where are you employed, please? National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, Maryland. On the night of November 22nd, 1963, did you perform an autopsy? I supervised an autopsy. Was this made on the late president? It was. What was revealed by the autopsy? Our examination revealed that the president was struck by two bullets. The first bullet struck the president in the back, just below the collarbone, and lodged in his body. The second bullet struck the president in the back of the head and fragmented. A splintered piece of the second bullet went through the president's neck and exited in the lower part of the neck. Point out the wounds on my neck and head, Doctor. So that your autopsy revealed that there were no entrance wounds in the front of the body. Is that correct, Doctor? That's right. There were no entrance wounds in the front. The shots definitely came from the rear. Objection, Your Honor. That is a conclusion on his part. He was not there. He may not position the parties. Sustained. Well then, did both bullets enter from the back? That's right. In your autopsy, did you recover any bullets, Doctor? We recovered one, the one that had lodged in the upper shoulder. What happened to that bullet? It was sent to the FBI laboratory in Washington for tests. Was the bullet intact? Was it in good shape? Objection, Your Honor. Unless counsel can qualify the witness as an expert on ballistics. Can you so qualify? I withdraw the question, Your Honor. Let me ask you a question on which you can qualify. In your opinion, as an expert, which of the two bullets was fatal? The first wound in the upper shoulder was relatively superficial. And in my opinion, the president could have readily survived if he had not been struck a second time in the head. Thank you, doctor. Pass the witness. Did you initial the bullet that was taken from the wound? I placed the mark on the butt end. Doctor, what medicines or drugs were indicated in this case? Plasma, whole blood, and possibly adrenaline. Thank you, doctor. That's all. Where were you employed on November 22nd, 1963? Superintendent of the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas. That's located near the corner of Houston Street near Elm. 
Yes, sir. Do you know Lee Harvey Oswald? I do. He was an employee of the Texas Depository. Is he in this courtroom today? Yes, sir. Would you indicate which of the persons in this courtroom is Lee Harvey Oswald? At that table there. What next occurred in connection with the defendant? Right after lunch, we assembled all the employees and I noticed Oswald was missing. Was he the only one missing? Yes, sir. I gave his description to the police so they could put it on the radio. Pass the witness. Sir, how many people were supposed to work in the building November the 22nd, 1963? About a hundred. Did any others have access to the building besides your regular employees? Yes, sir. Describe them. Uh, route men for the coin machines, delivery men for the cafeteria, truck drivers who delivered the books, and uh, other salesmen who had business there. Any others? Yes, sir. Sometimes an employee would have someone call on personal business. Do you know whether Lee Harvey Oswald was even in the building at the time the president was shot? No, sir. Where were you working on November 22nd? I was the elevator operator at the school book depository. Did you know the defendant at that time? Yes, sir, I knew him. Did you see Oswald on November 22nd? Yes, sir. It was right before lunch. I took him up to the top floor, the seventh floor, and I said to him, let's go down and watch the president go by, but he declined. In addition to the elevator, are there stairs? Does a stairway connect all the floors? Yes, sir. There are stairs and the elevator. Pass the witness. When you saw the defendant on that day, did he seem excited, disturbed, upset? No, sir. He seemed about usual. What time did you go to work? At 8 o'clock. Who did you take up first? I don't remember. Who was on your elevator for the first coffee break? I don't know. Yet you remember taking Oswald to the seventh floor. What time was it right before lunch? Well, it was before 12 o'clock. Who was the next person you hauled after Oswald? I don't know. Why is your memory so good about Oswald? Have the police been coaching you? Objection! He's arguing with the witness. Sustained. Don't do that again, Mr. Tyler. You know better. Are you the only elevator operator? Yes, sir. Except when I go to lunch or elsewhere. Who runs it then? Almost anyone. Oswald had no package at any time on November 22nd, 1963, when you hauled him. No, sir. How about a gun? No, sir. Were you around Oswald much while he worked there? No, sir. Then you don't know much about his mental condition? No, sir. No further questions. State your occupation, please, sir. I drive a bus for the city. On November 22nd, did you encounter Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, I was driving down Elm Street near Griffin uh, when this young man uh, came up and knocked on the door of the bus and I let him in. And how far is Elm and Griffin from Elm and Houston Streets? Oh, about four blocks. What happened after Oswald boarded your bus? Well, I drove about a, a block and then I got in this traffic jam. And a man said the president's been shot and the traffic's been blocked. Well, this woman asked for a transfer, and Oswald said he'd like to have one too, and he got off the bus. And what time was that? About 12.45 p.m. Past the witness. I suppose that you saw the defendant's picture in the paper, told the police about it, how Oswald had written your bus. No, I didn't know it was Oswald until the FBI traced the uh, transfer slip I gave him. How did they do that? Well, the transfer slip had my punch on it. Each driver has his own punch. In other words, had it not been for the transfer being traced, you'd never have remembered Oswald. No, he was just another passenger. Pass the witness. What is your occupation? I drive a cab. A taxi cab driver. Have you ever seen the defendant in this case prior to today? Yes. The day the president was shot. That would be November the 22nd? Yes, 
I had just had lunch and was parked uh, near the Greyhound bus station on the corner of Commerce and Lamar Streets. This fellow came up and said, can I take this cow? He got in and said, drive me to the 500 block of North Beckley. Did he say anything else to you while riding in your cab? Well, he got in and uh, I said, uh, what do you think happened back there? He didn't answer me. I thought to myself, now here's a guy who wants to be left alone. So I left him alone. And where did you take the defendant? I took the Houston Street Viaduct across the Trinity River, turned left on Beckley, and drove about uh, five blocks. He said, uh, this is all right right here. I pulled over the curb. He got out, and that's all that was said. Did he give you a tip? Well, if you call a nickel a tip, I guess he did. The fare was 95 cents, and he gave me a dollar. Did you make a record of this? Yes, we make a record of all trips. Here it is on my trip sheet. Did you record the time? Yes, I recorded uh, the time at from 12.30 until 12.45. We submit this trip sheet into evidence, Your Honor. Any objections, Mr. Tyler? No objections, Your Honor. Admitted. Pass the witness. You testify that you logged this trip between 12.30, 12.45 in the afternoon? Yes. Now, you are aware, sir, that the president was shot at approximately 12.30. Yes, sir. Then you think, sir, that a man could leave the school book building, walk five blocks, board a bus, Ride a block, get off and walk three blocks to your Objection, camp. Your but, Honor. Your Honor, we have a right to throw it out the discrepancy in this time ruling. I think you'll have to phrase your question in another way then, Mr. Tyler. Well, then, sir, did you log this time correctly or incorrectly? Well, I, uh, uh, I always mark them down in 15-minute intervals. I might have been off a little, but uh, not much. Now, the man you say you carried that day, did you notice anything unusual about his behavior? No, I didn't notice anything particularly unusual. I've hauled a lot of winos in my day. That's all, thank you. Ma'am, will you tell us, please, what you do? I'm the housekeeper at a rooming house at 1026 North Beckley. Did you ever rent a room to a man named O.H. Lee? Yes, sir. I rented him a small room for $8 a week on October the 14th. And is this man who called himself O.H. Lee present in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. That's him, Lee Oswald. When was the last time you saw the defendant prior to today? It was the day the president was killed. A friend called me on the telephone and told me the president had been shot. And I said, you were pulling my leg. But I turned on the television set, and she was right. Then Mr. Lee rushed in. He was in an awful hurry. About what time was this? Somewhere around one o'clock. I said, you sure are in a hurry. But he just rushed on through the living room to his room, and in a minute, he rushed out. Did you notice anything different about him when he left? Yes. He had changed his coat. When he came in, he was wearing a dark jacket. When he left, he was wearing a light tan jacket. I, th I think it's called a windbreaker or something like that. Did you see him with a pistol as he left? No. No, I didn't see a pistol. He left too fast. Where did he go when he left the house that day? He stopped at the bus stop for a few minutes, and then he walked on down Beckley Street toward the south. Thank you, ma'am. Your witness, counselor. Ma'am. How would you describe this man, O.H. Lee, who stayed at the rooming house? Was he a normal, friendly person? No. No, he seldom spoke to anyone. Stayed pretty much to himself. But he was neat and clean, ate a lot of fruit, and he made coffee and cheese sandwiches in his room at night. And he was in bed every night by 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Did he ever have any visitors at the boarding house? No, no visitors. And he never received any mail or phone calls. But there was this one number that he called a lot. 
He always talked in a foreign language. It sounded like German or Russian to me. Did he spend every night in the rooming house? Every night except weekends. He'd leave on Fridays and he wouldn't come back until Monday night. On the afternoon of November the 22nd, did some FBI and Secret Service men come to the house? Yes. They took Mr. Lee's clothes and his papers. Ma'am, to the best of your memory, do you recall whether these investigators showed you a search warrant or not? No. No, I don't recall their showing me anything. Thank you, ma'am. Would you describe for the court the circumstances in which you last saw the defendant on November 22nd? Well, I was waiting for a bus on East 10th Street, and it was a little after 1 o'clock. So I saw this police car pull up down the street for me, and then I saw this man walk over to the police car, and he leaned into the window to say something to the officer, and then the officer, well, he got out of the car and walked around the back to say something to him. And then all of a sudden, they just stopped and looked at each other. And then this man, he pulled out a gun. Objection! And he shot the officer three Objection. times. Objection! Objection, Your Honor. We object on the grounds that this evidence tends to prove a crime other than that for which the accused is on trial. The defendant can only be tried in this court for the crime charged in the indictment. Your Honor! We contend that the shooting of the police officer was committed as part of the same transaction, and that specifically it shows the defendant's flight from the scene of the crime for which he is on trial here today, and his intention to use all possible means to prevent arrest. Your Honor, we ask that this witness's testimony be stricken from the record. Now, wait a minute, gentlemen. This witness's testimony cannot be allowed to show any likelihood that the defendant committed the crime for which he is under indictment. However, it can be allowed to show flight and attempt to avoid arrest. So, overrule you, Mr. Tyler. Proceed. Note my exception. Now, ma'am, tell the jury what happened after the officer was shot. Well, the officer fell down. Oh, and then, of course, I ran to see if I could help him. And, you know, he tried to say something to me, but he couldn't. And, and then this man, well, he just shoved his pistol in his belt and ran off. What kind of jacket was the killer wearing? He was wearing an off-white cotton jacket. Can you now positively identify the man who shot the police officer? Well, I thought he was going to kill me, too. So you really look good at a time like that. A judicial. We don't want her thoughts. Sustained. Strike it out. Oh, yes. Yeah. The man that killed that officer was Lee Oswald. Pass the witness. Ma'am? When did you see Lee Harvey Oswald next? At the police department that afternoon. There was no lineup, was there? No. How long did you look at the man? Mm, two or three seconds. Two or three seconds. And yet you identified this man? Oh, yes. You were shown pictures first. No. The police told you that they suspected him of shooting Officer Tibbet and the president as well. Oh, yes. Describe the dress of the man who shot the officer. Well, I can only remember the jacket. Which hand was the gun in? I, I don't remember. Did the killer speak to you? No. Then you're only going by his face. His face and his size. You could be mistaken. No. No more questions. What is your occupation? I'm a patrolman for the Dallas Police Department. On the afternoon of November 22nd, did you make an arrest on the defendant in this case? Yes, I arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. Would you describe the circumstances surrounding that arrest? I had just checked out a false tip at the branch library. Uh, a call came in on the radio saying a man acting funny was holed up in the Texas theater. Uh, the call came from the cashier at the uh, picture show. I slipped out from behind the screen and headed up the aisle. Some fellow down near the front told me that the man I wanted was seated about three rows from the rear. I was crouching low with my gun ready for trouble. Did the defendant resist arrest? I headed up the aisle and turned into Oswald's row, and when we were no more than a foot apart, he stood up and put up both hands. It's all over now, he said. Then he hit me a good one in the face with his fist and went for his gun. I grabbed him around the waist, and we struggled and fell around on the seats for a few seconds, and I got my hand on the butt of his pistol, but he had his uh, finger on the trigger, and I heard the hammer click, but the 
primer was dented, but it didn't go off. This might have saved me. I got the gun out of his hand. Another officer held the pistol, and I held on to Oswald. Pass the witness. Officer, did the defendant say anything to you when you were taking him to the police car? He kept saying, I protest this police brutality. Did that sound a little strange to you? It sounded kind of crazy, considering the fact he had just tried to shoot my head off. Crazy. Thank you, officer. No more questions. Sir, do you know the defendant in this case, Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, I know Lee Harvey Oswald. How did you become acquainted with him? His wife and two children had been staying at one of our neighbor's house in Irving. Irving, that's a Dallas suburb. Yes, sir. Was Oswald also staying there at your neighbor's house? No. Well, yes, he stayed there on the weekends. I don't know where he stayed during the week. Did you see the defendant on November 22nd? Yes, I work at the school book depository, too. That Friday, he was staying at the neighbor's, and he called and asked if he could ride into work with me. I picked him up, and we drove into town. Did you notice anything unusual about him? Well, he was carrying a long package, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean. Describe this package. It was about three feet long. It was wrapped in brown paper. He said it was curtain rods. Pass the witness. Sir, do you know of your own knowledge what was in the package that the defendant was carrying that morning? No, I do not. Then it could have been curtain rods. Is that right? Could have been. I don't know. Now, you say that this package was no more than three feet long. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all. Would you state what you do, sir? I, uh, I'm a member of the Dallas Police Department. On November 22nd, did you participate in a search of the Texas School Book Depository? Yes, I did. I, uh, I helped search the sixth floor. The sixth floor? Yes. And would you tell us what you found there? Well, first we found what looked like, uh, a sniper's nest in one corner of the floor. And uh, the window was open. And uh, there were mm, three boxes stacked in front of the window. Oh, three and a half, four foot high. Did this window overlook Elm Street, where the presidential motorcade passed? Yes, sir, it did. From the window, you could see from Houston Street all the way to the uh, triple underpass. These three boxes in front of the window, could they have been used as a rifle rest by a sniper? Objection. He's leading. Your Honor, the question is within the realm of expert knowledge of a police officer. Objection overruled. Answer the question. Yes, sir, the uh, boxes could have been used as a rifle rest by a sniper. What else did you find in your search of the sixth floor? I found a rifle. Is this the rifle you found on the sixth floor of the school book depository building? Yes, sir, that is the rifle I found. I, uh, I found it in a stack of books at a stairwell on the sixth floor. We submit it into evidence, Your Honor. State's exhibit number two. Mr. Tyler? No objections. Admitted. Do you recognize these? Yes, sir. Those, uh, those are the three expended shells that I found in the sniper's nest that day. We submit them. State's exhibit number three. No objection. Admitted. happened to the rifle and the expended shells after you found them? We sent them off to the FBI lab in, in Washington. Pass the witness. Sir, how did you remove this rifle from the school book depository building? I, I carried it out. Would you tell us how long that rifle is? Forty inches. 
Is that type rifle quite common in the USA? I don't know. Don't you know that they are sold by the thousand by mail order houses? I'm not familiar with them. Didn't you handle that gun with your bare hands before you turned it over to the lab for fingerprints? Yes, sir. No more questions. Would you tell the court what your job is, please? I'm a supervisor at the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. I hand you what has been submitted as state's exhibits two and three and ask you if you can identify them. Yes, I can. That's the rifle and shells sent to us at the laboratory in connection with the death of the president. I also hand you these and ask if you can identify them. Yes, these are the three bullets recovered by our agents and sent to me for ballistics tests. One of the bullets was recovered from the stretcher on which the president was carried into the hospital. The second one came from the floor of the car in which the president rode. And the third bullet was taken from the president's body in the autopsy. We submit these into evidence, Your Honor. State's exhibit number four. No objection. Admitted. Would you identify the rifle? Yes, it's an Italian-made military surplus carbine, a 6.5 millimeter bolt-action Carcano. How many shells does the rifle hold? Six. It holds six rounds of ammunition. What kinds of tests were made on the rifle and the ammunition? Comparison tests were made on the ballistics, the bullets and the empty cartridge cases. Also, we examined the rifle and the cartridge cases for fingerprints. What were you able to determine about the empty shells? We determined that the empty cartridge cases were all three fired from that rifle. How were you able to determine this, sir? Well, first, we obtained identical rounds of ammunition to those. Then we fired them through the rifle for comparison purposes. What kind of marks do you use for comparison of empty cartridge cases? Breech block marks, firing pin impressions, marks from extractors, ejectors, marks due to expansion, and uh, loading mechanism marks. And you were able to determine positively that those cartridges were fired in that rifle? Positively. I believe you also said you made ballistics tests. Yes, we obtained test bullets, fired them in the rifle, compared them with the recovered bullets. And what were your conclusions? We found that the bullets that killed the president were fired in that rifle. Can you identify this, please? Yes, these are photomicrographs comparing a test bullet with the recovered bullets. You can see the primary markings due to land and grooves, uh, riflings, are identical, as are the fine striations in all of the marks. We offer the enlarged photomicrographs as evidence, Your Honor. States exhibit number five. No objections. Admitted. No, sir. I believe you also testified that you examined the weapon for fingerprints. Will you tell us what you found in that respect? We were able to lift several latent finger and palm prints from the rifle. All of these were identified as those of police officers handling the rifle before it got to the lab, with the exception of one palm print. Were you able to identify positively that palm print? Yes. It matched the palm print of Lee Harvey Oswald. How were you able to determine this? We obtained Oswald's finger and palm prints from his military service record and also from the Dallas Police Department. The print lifted from the rifle matched the palm print from these records. Can you identify this? Yes, those are photostatic reproductions of the palm print lifted from the rifle and the palm print taken from the defendant's service record. We offer them, Your Honor, State's Exhibit Number 6. No objection. Admitted. Thank you, sir. Pass the witness.
palm prints aren't used by the police or anybody else for identifying people. No, sir. They're not shown to be as accurate as fingerprints. Yes, sir, to some extent. Well, then why don't you use palm prints instead of fingerprints in your identification system? Fingerprints are more reliable. How many points of similarity between the palm prints found on the rifle and Oswald's known palm print were you able to demonstrate? Five. Is it not a fact that fingerprint experts will not express a positive opinion of fingerprint identification without at least nine points of demonstrable similarity? Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all. What is your occupation, sir? I'm a chemist for the Dallas Police Laboratory. On the afternoon of November 22nd, did you make a dermal nitrate test on the person of Lee Harvey Oswald? I did. Would you explain for the court what a dermal nitrate test is? Well, nitrate is one of the products of combustion of gunpowder. So we chemically test any burned residue from a person's skin to determine whether he has recently fired a, a weapon. This is done by applying a paraffin gauntlet to the person's skin and by testing the collected residue for the presence of nitrogen. And what did you find in the so-called paraffin test on Lee Harvey Oswald? Objection. This evidence was obtained when the defendant was being interrogated for at least 24 hours without counsel and by teams of interrogators. This shows no free voluntary consent to take the test. Objection overruled. Answer the question. We found definite traces of nitrogen in the residue from his hands. Ask the witness. Isn't it true there are other materials that give the same chemical reaction as nitrates? Yes, there are. Isn't it true that a positive nitrate reaction could be caused by cigarette smoking, the handling of fertilizer, the presence of urine on the hands? Yes, that's true, but... Conversely, isn't it true that I could fire a gun and an immediate paraffin test fail to reveal nitrate? Yes, that's possible. Well, how do you account for the presence of nitrate on both hands? I cannot answer that. Your Honor, we contend that the witness's testimony is inconclusive, should be stricken from the record. It is only the trigger hand which is near the chamber and the firing pin which sometimes collects nitrate from the escaping gas. The jury will determine how much weight to give this testimony. Overrule you. Stand down. What do you do, sir? I am a handwriting analyst for the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington, D.C. Would you identify this, sir? Yes. That is a letter ordering a rifle and a four-power telescope for $19.95. And where did you obtain this? It was furnished to us by a mail-order house in Chicago. FBI agents used the serial number on the rifle to determine that the rifle was sold by the firm. Could you tell us the date of the letter? The person who ordered the rifle and the place where it was shipped the letter was dated March 20th, 1963. The signature is signed A. Heidel, and it was shipped to a post office box at the main post office in Dallas. We offer this in evidence, Your Honor. Your Honor, my only objection is that it's not relevant or shown to be connected with Lee Harvey Oswald. Subject to connection. Admitted. I will ask you to identify this, sir. Yes, that's an application for a post office box at the Dallas Post Office. Who made this application? It was signed by Lee H. Oswald. Is the box number on the application by Oswald the same box number to which the rifle was mailed? Yes, it is the same box number. We offer it into evidence, Your Honor. States Exhibit Number 7. Same connection and relevancy objection. Admitted for the time being. If not connected, I'll strike it. Did you determine who wrote those documents? Yes, I did. 
They were both written by the same man, Lee Oswald. Pass the witness. I assume, sir, that you examined these documents with a known specimen of the defendant's handwriting. Yes, I used several known exemplars from his records. Isn't it true, sir, that despite all these pseudo-scientific techniques, handwriting experts sometimes disagree on who wrote a given document? Well, yes. However, in this case... You did not have unknown samples mixed in with the defendants? No, sir. You just had known samples and one suspect sample. Yes. Would not a lineup procedure of specimens be fairer? Possibly. You knew that the prosecution wanted to prove Lee Harvey Oswald wrote and signed that application before you examined it. Yes, sir. Can you read a person's character by his handwriting? Certainly not. And these people who say they can are fakes. Yes. But they say they're handwriting experts just the way you do. That's all. State your occupation, please, sir. I'm a, a technician at a film processing laboratory. Following the shooting of the president on November 22nd, did you process and study certain 8 millimeter motion picture films which recorded the events in the presidential car during the time the shots actually were fired? Yes, I did. Your Honor, we ask the court's permission to demonstrate this film. Your Honor, we object to this demonstration. This aspect of the case has been covered by other witnesses. These films might tend to prejudice the jury. Your Honor, we intend to offer new evidence in connection with this film. Your Honor, the witness can testify as to his findings without the demonstration of these films in the courtroom. I see no reason for showing the film. Let the witness testify to his findings. We offer the film into evidence, Your Honor, States Exhibit Number 9. No objections. Admitted. From your study of the films, could you estimate the speed of the presidential car at the time of the shooting? Well, we uh, examined the camera that took the film and discovered that the true speed was 18 frames per second. Now, with that knowledge, we could uh, determine that the presidential car was traveling from 12 to 15 miles per hour. From your study, could you reconstruct the precise timing and placing of the shots? Uh, uh, the first shot struck the president at approximately 170 feet from the sniper's window in the school book warehouse. The second struck Governor Connolly about four and one-ten seconds later. And the third uh, struck the president in the head about two and seven-ten seconds later. The distance from the sniper's window at the uh, time of the third shot was approximately 260 feet. What then would be the total time elapsed between the firing of the first and the third shots? Uh, the total time elapsed would have been about uh, six and eight ten seconds. Pass the witness. From your studies of the films, could you determine the definite direction from which the bullets were fired? Yeah, well, they, they appeared to come... Not from... the appearance, sir. The definite direction. Oh, no, I, I couldn't determine that. Not definitely. I move that the witness's testimony about the distance from which the bullets were fired be stricken from the record. He's already stated he doesn't know where they came from. Sustained. Strike it from the record. That part about the distances. The jury is instructed to disregard it. No further questions. I show you what has been marked state's exhibit number two, and ask if you can identify it. Yes, I test fired that rifle recently. Was that since November 22nd? Yes. Would you describe that test firing? Did you attempt to simulate the conditions of a sixth floor sniper? Yes. I fired three shots at a moving target between 100 and 300 feet away, at about a 40-degree angle downhill. Did you hit the moving target? Yes, with all three shots. 
was an accurate record made of the time that elapsed between your first and your third shot? Yes, six and two-tenths seconds. 6.2 seconds. That means you fired the three shots in six-tenths seconds time less than is indicated by the film. Objection! He's leading. This witness has no personal knowledge of these films. Sustained. In your opinion as an expert rifleman, how good a marksman would the man who killed the president have to be? He would have to have been better than average, but he needn't have been an expert. The distance was not great, assuming that he had a telescopic sight. Objection! There's no evidence of the distance. Sustained. Strike the distance was not great remark. Your witness. Sir, have you ever participated in an organized shooting match, a tournament, whatever they call them? Yes. How many of these have you won? I won several. In other words, you are far above the average, a highly superior marksman. I suppose so, uh, yes. I believe that's all. Thank you. Would you tell us what you do, miss? I'm a librarian at the uh, New Orleans Public Library. Do your library records show that in the summer of 1963, one Lee Harvey Oswald had a library card from your library? Yes, sir. Our records show that a library card was issued to him on May 3rd. Do your records also show what books he checked out from the library? Mm, yes, it shows the books. Did he check out a book about the president? Yes, he checked out a book entitled uh, Portrait of a President. Did he check out a book about Huey Long? Yes, The Assassination of Huey Long. Pass the witness. Can you identify the man sitting there as the man who had the library card? No, sir. How many other books did the man check out of your library during that period? Oh, about, uh, 15. Your Honor, I move that the evidence be stricken from the record as not being connected with the defendant. Mr. Tyler, your objection goes to the weight of the evidence, not admissibility. Overruled. No more questions. Where are you employed? I am an announcer for a radio station in New Orleans. Have you ever met the defendant, Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, he appeared on my radio panel show August 21st, 1963. You were asked to bring the tape recording of that show on which the defendant appeared? Yes, I have it right here. Thank you. We offer it in evidence, Your Honor. No objections. Admitted. Your Honor. This recording relates to the character and possible motive of the defendant in this case, and we ask the court's permission to play it at this time. Permission granted. Are you or have you been a communist? Well, I had answered that uh, uh, prior to this program on another radio program. Are you a Marxist? Uh, Yes, I am a Marxist. What's the difference? Well, the difference is uh, primarily the difference between a country like Ghana, Guyana, Yugoslavia, uh, China, or Russia. Uh, very, very great differences. I'm curious to know just how you supported yourself during the three years that you lived in the Soviet Union. Did you have a government subsidy? Uh, well, as I, uh, uh, well, I will answer that, uh, that uh, question directly then, uh, since, uh, uh, you will not rest until you get your answer. Uh, I worked in Russia. Uh, I was under uh, the protection of the, uh, of the, uh, I was, that is to say, I was not under the protection of the uh, American government, but that is, I was uh, at all times uh, considered an American citizen. I did not uh, lose my uh, 
American citizenship. I'm Pardon back. Me. Uh, Excuse me. May yeah. I interrupt just one second? Uh, either one of these two statements is wrong. The Washington Evening Star of October 31st, 1959, page one, reported that Lee Harvey Oswald, a farmer marine of 4936 Collingwood Street, Fort Worth, Texas, had turned in his passport at the American Embassy in Moscow on that same date, and it said that he had applied for Soviet citizenship. Now, this seems to me that you've renounced your American citizenship if you've turned in your passport. Well, the very obvious answer to that is that I'm back in the United States. The person who renounces his citizenship, citizenship becomes legally uh, disqualified for returning to the United States. How many people do you have in your committee here in New Orleans? Uh, I cannot reveal that. A secretary of the uh, Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Is it a secret society? Uh, it is not. However, it is a, a standard operating procedure uh, for a political organization consisting of a uh, political minority uh, to safeguard the names and the number of its members. Well, the Republicans are in the minority. I don't see them hiding their membership. The Republicans are not a, uh, well, <laughs> the Republicans uh, are a established political party representing a great many people. They represent no radical point of view. They do not have a very violent and sometimes emotional opposition, as we do. We are in a minority, surely. Uh, we are, however, not particularly interested in what Cuban exiles or rightist uh, uh, members of uh, rightist organizations have to say. We are primarily interested in the attitude of the United States government toward Cuba. And in that uh, way, we are striving to get the United States to adopt measures which would be more friendly toward uh, the Cuban people and the new Cuban regime in, in, uh, in that uh, country. Uh, we are not uh, at all uh, communist controlled, regardless of the fact that I have the experience of living in Russia, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, uh, we have been investigated, uh, regardless of any of those facts. Uh, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is an independent organization, not affiliated with any other organization. Our aims and our ideals are very clear and in the best keeping with American traditions of democracy. Do you agree with uh, Fidel Castro when he, in his last speech of July 26 of this year, he qualified President John Fitzgerald Kennedy of the United States as a ruffian and a thief. Do you agree with uh, Mr. Castro? I would, not agree. I would not agree with that uh, particular wording. However, I and the uh, Fair Play for Cuba Committee does think that the United States government, through certain agencies, namely the State Department and the CIA, has made monumental mistakes in its relations with Cuba. Ask the witness. No questions. Call your next witness. At this time, Your Honor, the state rests. Is the defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. Then call your first witness. What is your profession? I'm a psychiatrist. Have you ever in your professional capacity made a psychiatric examination of the defendant, Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, I examined him for the children's court in New York City. And when was that, Doctor? 1952. How old was Lee Oswald at that time? He was 13 years old. Do you know why he was brought into the children's court? Well, he was brought in because he was a chronic truant. What did you find in your psychiatric examination of Lee Oswald? He has a schizoid personality with passive-aggressive tendencies. On the surface, he's calm, but inside him, there's much anger. Did you consider him dangerous? Well, his tendency is to act out his fantasies, and the paranoid coloring of his thinking certainly represented a danger to himself and to others. Did you feel he was likely to be more dangerous to a particular kind of person? Well, I made this observation at the time. The fact that he does not have a father makes him extremely resentful of people who derive benefits from the fact that they still have a father. This will cause him to be extremely vengeful to authority or to father figures. What action did you recommend to the Children's Court in New York City? Well, I felt that Oswald was beyond maternal control, and I recommended that he be placed in a home for disturbed and neglected children. A home for disturbed and neglected children? Yes, sir. However, 
the institutions were too crowded and the boy stayed with his mother. Did you make a report, doctor, in the regular course of your practice? Yes, I did. Here it is. Thank you. We offer this in evidence, Your Honor. Defense exhibit number one. No objections. Admitted. Pass the witness. Doctor? How many persons are there in this country who suffer from a schizoid personality with passive-aggressive tendencies? Well, quite a few of them. I can't give you figures. Well, would it be in the thousands? Oh, yes. Definitely in the thousands. No, Doctor. How many of these thousands of schizoids go around killing people? Well, I can't say how many. Uh, certainly some of them do. On the contrary, Doctor. Don't most of these people manage to live out their lives without becoming criminals? Well, yes, most of them do. In fact, isn't it generally accepted among psychiatrists that Woodrow Wilson was a schizophrenic paranoid? Objection! Sustained, unless he knows that of his own knowledge. Now, Doctor, you say you made this test on the defendant when he was 13 years old. Isn't that quite young for someone to develop the type of schizophrenia you call paranoid? Well, yes, well, um... Ordinarily, the schizoid personality develops during the ages of 25 to 40. Isn't that correct, Doctor? Yes, ordinarily, that is true. Doctor, is there a type of schizophrenia called childhood schizophrenia? Yes, there is. Would you describe that? Well, actually, the big difference between this and the other kind is that it usually occurs before puberty. What are the symptoms? Well, there's a definite withdrawal from other students, a disorganization of thought processes, distorted emotional reactions, and fantasy. Is there usually a change in the mother-child relationship? Yes, there is. We call this a, a frosting. It's a cooling of the mother-child relationship. Isn't it quite possible, Doctor, that the defendant, Lee Harvey Oswald, was suffering from childhood schizophrenia rather than paranoid? Objection! Sustained. And isn't it also true, Doctor, that the schizophrenic child often recovers and becomes quite a normal adult? Well, yes. Often the child restructures his defense mechanisms and recovers with proper therapy. And sometimes without proper therapy. Well, yes. One more question. Was your diagnosis of the defendant corroborated by any other psychiatrist at that time? As far as I know, I made the only examination. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, what is your profession? I am a psychiatrist. Is your license on file in the county clerk's office? I have two licenses on file. One is an MD and one is a psychiatrist. Where are you practicing? At the Crestridge Sanitarium. How long have you been practicing? Fifteen years. Doctor, at my request, did you make a psychiatric examination of the defendant, Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes. We made clinical, psychological, and neurological tests. What is your conclusion as to the defendant's mental condition? The defendant suffers from a major mental disorder. Is there a name for this, doctor? Yes. Schizophrenia, paranoic type. Would you describe schizophrenia for us? In uh, common usage, it has come to mean a split personality, a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, but this is really misleading, for it isn't really a splitting of the personality as much as a disorganization of the thought processes that causes a person to be out of touch with reality. Is this a serious disorder, Doctor? Yes, it is a major mental illness of functional psychosis and the most common of the various psychotic disorders. To the layman, doctor, does this mean he is insane? Objection! It is up to the jury to decide if this man is insane. Your Honor, the question was asked in general, not as it applies to the defendant. I believe I sustain the objection. The witness has testified that in his opinion, the defendant is schizophrenic, and that is what you are now asking. 
Would you describe the classical symptoms of the schizoid personality? These usually include a withdrawal from society because his contacts with others prove unrewarding. He turns to fantasy, which often includes hallucinations and delusions of persecution and grandeur, usually with a constant attitude of suspicion and hostility. Is there a particular kind of person that is prone to this disease? Yes, definitely. Would you describe that person? Well, often it involves the loss of a parent at an early age. There is either a rejecting or overprotecting parent-child relationship. The child interprets the world as frustrating and hostile and withdraws from active participation. He hides his hostility behind a facade of goodness and meekness. As this good child enters adolescence, he tends to be overly serious, painfully self-conscious, inhibited, and prone to prefer his own company. Often he's unduly preoccupied with various religious and philosophical issues. Normal interest in the opposite sex is lacking. His whole problem is often complicated, too, by unrealistic levels of aspiration and altruistic ethical ideals to which he expects others to conform. Such a psychologically vulnerable individual is, of course, easily hurt by the inevitable setbacks and frustrations of adult life. When he feels persecuted, he may suddenly attack someone whom he is sure is persecuting him. Now, Doctor, from your study of the defendant's history and your own observations, does he fit this description? He is as close to the classical description of the schizoid as I've ever encountered. Go on. He found his Marine Corps experience unrewarding, and by now thoroughly engrossed in his newfound philosophy, Marxism, he felt the only place he could find any acceptance would be in Russia. He went there in late 1959, Shortly thereafter, he met and married a Russian girl. Eight months later, according to him, he and his wife were trying to get back in the United States, although he had earlier sworn that he would never do this. Evidently, he'd failed again to find the acceptance he so desperately needed. And it is also quite possible that his marriage was somewhat rewarding, and this provided some recovery from his mental illness. Did he tell you about coming back to this country? Yes. But here again, he found that pleasant associations were even more impossible. He blamed his employers for the loss of one job after another. Finally, his life was so uh, impossible because of his persecutions that he felt he had to get even with society for the wrongs done him. Did he discuss the president with you? No, he became highly emotional. This was one area we couldn't talk about. He wouldn't say anything about it except that he was innocent. Doctor, do you know the legal definition for insanity in this state? Yes, it is in keeping with the McNaughton rule. And would you tell us what that is? Well, simply stated, it is that if the person knows the difference between right and wrong and the nature and consequences of his act, then he is legally sane. Now, Doctor, in your opinion, was Lee Harvey Oswald legally insane when he shot and killed the president, if he did. In my opinion, he was definitely insane and has been for several years. And did he know the difference between right and wrong and the nature and consequence of his act? No, in my opinion, he did not. Thank you, doctor. Your witness. Doctor, did you find anything organically wrong with the defendant? Was his brain or nervous system damaged in any way? Did he have epilepsy or syphilis? No, he had no organic disorders that I could detect. Then his trouble was strictly psychological, is that right, Doctor? Yes. What tests did you give this defendant? We gave him IQ tests, personality tests such as the MMPI, the TAT, the Make a Picture test, and the Rorschach test. Well, what was his IQ, Doctor? Slightly above average. That would be slightly above 110? Yes. What about the Rorschach test? You show him those ink blots? Yes. How about the picture of the sad young man standing by the window with the old woman? Yes, the thematic apperception tests. We showed him those. Now, doctor, is there a classification for what you call schizophrenia paranoia? 
It is a functional mental psychosis. You call these people psychotics, is that right? Yes, psychotics. Are you familiar with Coleman's book, Abnormal Psychology in Modern Living? Yes, I recall it vaguely. I am reading now from chapter 8. It has been estimated that there are some one million psychotics in the United States. Of these, two-thirds are hospitalized in state, veterans, county, city, or private hospitals. The remainder are cared for at home for one reason or another. Uh, do you agree with that statement, Doctor? Yes, fundamentally, although there are perhaps more than that now. To your knowledge, was Lee Harvey Oswald ever cared for in a hospital or at home as a psychotic? No, not to my knowledge. Then, Doctor, are there degrees of schizophrenia, paranoia? Certainly, yes. And those who are unable to manage their personal affairs properly or perform their social responsibilities must be cared for either in a hospital or at home. Yes, and more should be cared for than are. At what point does a person stop being just mean and become crazy? Can you be more specific? Mm, yes, I can. If a man is oriented as to time, place, and distance, and he is able to converse with those around him, is he of unsound mind? If he takes a gun and kills another person? Many persons know these things and are committed to mental hospitals by the courts, and justly so. Did Oswald's military service records show that he had any mental disorder? To my knowledge, they did not. You mean they didn't detect the schizoid personality you say he had for years? I could give you a dozen reasons why they didn't. Now, Doctor, if a man is able to conceive and carry out a crime and flee from the scene of the crime, is he of unsound mind? I don't know. I'd have to know more about it. What if this man bought a rifle under an assumed name? Read in the newspapers that his intended victim would pass by the building where he worked at a certain time. Took this rifle and ammunition, concealed this weapon from his friends. Lay in wait. Fired three well-aimed shots into the backs of his intended victims. Avoided apprehension in the building fled to his room, changed his coat, got a pistol, shot a policeman to prevent arrest. Does this man know the difference between right and wrong? Does he know the nature and consequences of his act? If you are referring to Oswald, he did not. I'm not referring to Oswald. I am referring to a hypothetical case. No, I don't know. Doctor... Do you favor another test for insanity other than the McNaughton rule? The rule about the difference between right and wrong and the nature and consequences of an act? Yes, I do favor a more modern legal test for sanity. Isn't there a school of psychiatry that holds that any person who commits murder is insane? Yes, there is that school of thought. Aren't there some of those around Dallas? Objection! Sustained. No further questions. Stand down, please. Call your next witness. At this time, Your Honor, the defense rests. Mr. Tyler, does the defendant wish to testify? No, Your Honor. At this time, the state closes, Your Honor. The defense closes, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Close the testimony. Excuse all the witnesses. I will work on the charge, the instructions of law. And when both the state and the defense attorneys have approved it, we will hear the charge and the arguments. It now becomes my duty to read to you the charge under the law. The defendant stands charged by indictment with the offense of murder, alleged to have been committed in the county of Dallas, state of Texas, on or about the 22nd day of November, 1963. To this charge, the defendant has stood mute, and under the law, we must interpret this as a plea of not guilty. 
the defense attorney has entered an additional plea, as is his prerogative, and that plea is not guilty by reason of existing insanity. This is a case depending for conviction on circumstantial evidence. In such cases, it is not sufficient that the circumstances coincide with, account for, and therefore render probable the guilt of the defendant. The facts and the circumstances must exclude to a moral certainty every other reasonable hypothesis except the defendant's guilt, and unless they do so, beyond a reasonable doubt, you will find the defendant not guilty. Unsound mind or affliction of insanity must be of such a degree as to obliterate the sense of right or wrong, depriving the accused of the power of choosing between right and wrong as to the particular act done, if any. Whether the insanity be general or partial, whether continuous or periodical, the degree of it must have been sufficiently great to have controlled the will of the accused and taken from him the freedom of moral action at the time of the commission of the act. If you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant Lee Harvey Oswald did with malice aforethought shoot and kill John F. Kennedy, as set forth in the indictment, you will find him guilty of murder with malice and fix his punishment at death or by confinement in the state penitentiary. If you have a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant, or if you believe that he was legally insane at the time of the commission of the act, or that the defendant is now insane, you will find Lee Harvey Oswald not guilty and acquit him and state whether he is now sane or insane. In all criminal cases, the burden of proof is on the state. You are the exclusive judges of the facts proved, of the credibility of the witnesses, and of the weight to be given to the testimony but you are bound to receive the law from the court which is herein given you and be governed thereby. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we will hear the arguments by the attorneys. Are you ready to proceed, gentlemen? May it please the court. Mr. Tyler. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, every man, no matter what crime he is accused of, is entitled to the time and attention of an impartial jury. And on behalf of the defendant, we thank you. Let us be frank. This man, Lee Harvey Oswald, stands accused of a crime, the most infamous crime that you and I will ever know. He stands accused of violently striking down the best known man in the world, our late president. I cannot nor would I, if I could, diminish the memory or belittle the loss of one so great. Yet, prompted by the compassion which our president felt for all men, and the justice which he demanded for each man, I must defend the accused to the best of my ability, and you must judge him to the best of your ability. Not with hate, not with prejudice, not with hostility, not to assuage a guilt conscience with a scapegoat. In a moment, Mr. Adkins will present you with an overwhelming amount of evidence against the accused. But remember, it is all circumstantial evidence. No one actually saw who committed this infamous crime. The state had even more evidence, but they knew I could strike it down and they didn't even offer it. Wherever I could, I have challenged the evidence as it was introduced. I shall not do so again. Rather, I will leave it to you to determine the conclusiveness of this circumstantial evidence. But should you believe from that evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald actually committed murder, I want you to remember what the judge has told you. If the accused 
was insane at the time the act was committed, you cannot find him guilty. You must acquit him because he was unaccountable for his act. And you know that this man is insane. You heard that psychiatrist from New York testify that Oswald had a major mental illness when he was 13 years old. Now the defense called a learned psychiatrist who had made a thorough examination of the defendant. And what did he find out? That Lee Harvey Oswald had been mentally ill for years, a schizophrenic paranoid, a major functional mental disorder. And he further said that Oswald was legally insane that he did not know the difference between right and wrong, nor the nature and consequence of his act if and when he committed it. Isn't it time that we stop deluding ourselves into a feeling of righteous indignation and bolstering our own self-respect by making a convenient scapegoat of the mentally sick? Isn't it time that we gave this man, Lee Harvey Oswald, the treatment care that he needed and was entitled to 11 years ago? Isn't it time that society makes room for those who suffer the tortures of the damned? If Lee Harvey Oswald fired the bullet that killed the president, then the fuse has been burning inside him for 11 years. He could not put it out. And we failed to help him put it out you must have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's sanity. Write a verdict of insane as of November the 22nd, 1963, and now insane, so that Oswald may be locked up in a state mental hospital until he is cured, if ever. I now place the life of Lee Harvey Oswald in your hands. I know that your verdict will be quick it will be just, it will be not guilty for reason of insanity. I thank you. May it please the court. Mr. Adkins. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my colleague in the law, Mr. Tyler, has made an impassioned plea for proper care for the mentally ill. Certainly, we can have no protest to that. But when a man with cunning, skill, malice, takes up a gun and murders another man because it is a part of his warped political philosophy, or for any other reason, and then tries to hide behind the plea of insanity. I call that the greatest injustice of all. And Lee Harvey Oswald is the man who killed our president. He and he alone pulled the trigger that let loose those devastating bullets to strike down our beloved leader. The evidence points conclusively and overwhelmingly to him. Never in all my life before have I seen evidence more conclusive. And circumstantial evidence can be more conclusive than actual witnesses to a crime. Let's review just how conclusive the evidence is in this case. Witnesses have testified that they saw the president shot in a motorcade on Elm Street, near the intersection of Houston Street. Another witness testified that he saw a man firing the fatal bullets from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository building. Officers investigating that building found a sniper's nest. And this rifle and three empty cartridge cases. Ballistics tests prove that this rifle fired the fatal bullets into the back of the president. Now, whose rifle was this? Who used it? It was ordered in March from a Chicago firm and shipped to a post office box belonging to Lee Harvey Oswald 
proved by the serial number on the rifle and by the handwriting expert. A palm print found on the rifle matched the palm print of Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald worked in the school book depository building and had free access to all of its floors. On the morning of November 22nd, the day of the shooting, according to the testimony of a neighbor, Lee Harvey Oswald carried a package wrapped in brown paper into the building. Oswald told the neighbor the package contained curtain rods. Witnesses placed him in the building shortly before and immediately following the shooting. At a roll call of all the employees in the building, shortly after the shooting, Lee Harvey Oswald was the only one missing. And where was he? He had fled. A bus driver and a taxi cab driver took him to his residence on Beckley Street. There, a housekeeper saw him changed his coat and rushed out. A few minutes later, another witness saw him shoot a police officer three times, killing him in cold-blooded fury. You heard the arresting officer tell how he had tried to kill him when he arrested him in a theater a few minutes later. Now, why did Oswald kill the president? Why did he plan and carry out his loathsome scheme? Was it because, as the defense claims, he was insane? Not unless every Marxist is insane and can commit any crime he pleases and be acquitted because of insanity. You know Oswald was a Marxist. You heard him say so on that record of the radio program. Now, what is the Marxist philosophy about killing? Oh, they say that it is perfectly all right to kill a man if he stands between them and their objectives. Because this philosophy is foreign to us and to our laws, does this make the Marxist insane? Like any other Marxist fanatic, certainly Lee Harvey Oswald was mentally deranged. All the psychiatrists have testified that he is schizophrenic, and no doubt he is. But the state psychiatrist told you that his illness did not render Oswald incapable of knowing right from wrong, or the nature and consequences of his act. If he did not know the consequences, why did he flee? Why did he resist arrest? Could an insane person plan with such cunning, smuggle a rifle into the building, lay in wait so patiently, estimate the speed of the vehicle, judge the distance, and take such devastating aim and fire three accurate shots in less than seven seconds? If such a person be insane, God help us all. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is up to you to set the price for murder of the president in Dallas County. Do your duty under the law and the evidence, and there can be only one possible verdict. When you retire to deliberate, you will vote the defendant guilty. And I say to you, Lee Harvey Oswald, you are guilty as the evidence shows. You have turned your back on the human race. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there is only one fit punishment, and that punishment is death in the electric chair. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will now retire to the jury room to consider your verdict.
Ladies and gentlemen, a brief commentary by the special consultant for this film, one of the nation's distinguished defense attorneys, Charles Tesmer of Dallas, Texas. The trial you have just seen was, of course, a dramatization. For Lee Harvey Oswald never stood trial. He himself was shot to death on November the 24th, 1963, just 47 hours after President Kennedy was fatally wounded. The drama is based entirely on details publicly announced by law enforcement officials. And we believe the trial you have seen closely resembles the one Oswald would have actually received had he lived. Assuming these details as being true and correct, then the case against Lee Harvey Oswald was a strong one circumstantially. Apparently no eyewitness saw Oswald actually shoot the president. If the past predicts the future, then Lee Harvey Oswald would probably have been found guilty and executed. The presidential assassins who appear in the dusty pages of history were all either killed or tried and executed despite strong insanity pleas on the behalf of some. One who is accused of a crime of such magnitude as the murder of the president faces a hopeless task in proving his innocence. Perhaps a valuable lesson may be learned from this case, that one accused of a crime, regardless of the seriousness of the charge, should be tried in the courts and not in the newspapers and in the news media. <laughs>